Burns are the most common injury to welders. No, I'm not talking about the quick-witted insult type of burns. I'm talking about the fry your skin and char your flesh kind of burns. Welding arcs are very intense and can cause burns to skin and eyes with just a few minutes of exposure. Your protective clothing should provide good coverage from sparks, welding spatter, and arc radiation while allowing freedom of movement. If you leave a button undone, the arc will find it. Many types of clothing will protect you from ultraviolet radiation, but should never prevent ultra-hip choreography. When it comes to clothing, leather and wool are where it's at. Why? They are durable and fire-resistant. Avoid synthetics, not just because they're tacky. There's a practical reason, too. When exposed to extreme heat, synthetics melt and can cause severe burns. Nothing is more embarrassing than having your shirt burst into flames when you're laying down the perfect bead on a steel girder 300 feet in the air. Wear leather and or wool. Leather boots are the best foot protection. Six to eight inch ankle coverage. Consider safety toe protection if you're doing heavy work. Metatarsal guards over the shoelaces are smart too. What's metatarsal mean? You just need to know, it's these things that go over your shoelaces. <laughs> Fashion tip, don't roll up your sleeves or pant cuffs. Sparks or hot metal can get caught in the folds, and while that's a great recipe for some hilarious physical comedy, it's also very dangerous. Wear your boots like this to keep out sparks and flying metal. Not like this, not like this, and definitely not like this. Like this. Gloves. They're like five-legged pants for your hands. Leather is the best material to protect you from burns, cuts, and scratches. And if they're dry and in good condition, they'll offer you some insulation against electric shock. Working with sharp metal? Look into cut-resistant gloves. Oh yeah, they're for real. Let's finally get to the reason you're becoming a welder. The helmet. Not only do they look super cool, they are essential to protect your eyes from radiation exposure and your face and neck from burns. You've got your infrared radiation, which can generally be felt as heat, and your ultraviolet radiation, which can't be felt, and is therefore all the more dangerous. Infrared radiation can cause retinal damage and cataracts. Ultraviolet radiation can cause welder's flash, which can result in extreme discomfort, swelling, fluid excretion from the eyes, and even temporary blindness. I know, it's tough to look at, David, but it's important for you to see this so you'll be prepared to protect yourself, because the worst part is, you might not even know you've got welder's flash for several hours after exposure. Welding helmets have a variety of shaded lenses to protect your eyes from infrared and ultraviolet radiation, as well as visible light from the arc which can hurt your eyes in the same way that staring into the sun can. Many helmets these days have auto-darkening shades. Read those instructions carefully to figure out how to set that up properly. With other helmets, you can change the protective lens depending on the type of welding you're doing. The general rule is, find the lens where it's too dark to see the arc clearly, then back up one level to the next lighter shade. Shielded metal arc welding with a small diameter electrode generally requires protective shading of seven and up while processes like carbon arc welding require protective shading as high as 14. Read all the safety warnings and guidelines to make sure you're being properly protected. Repeated exposure to UV radiation can cause permanent eye damage and skin cancer. Like getting a sunburn, this happens slowly over time, and you won't always know you're being overexposed because you can't see or feel the UV rays. Contact lenses should be fine, but do your homework. Talk to your ophthalmologist and company medical staff. And you know what? Probably don't wear contacts in really dusty environments or where there's danger of chemical splash or exposure to corrosive or organic solvent vapors. Safety glasses are a great way to look smart and appear as though you know what you're doing. They also offer extra eye protection. Protect your ears with earplugs or ear muffs. This keeps flying particles from damaging the inside of your ear and protects your hearing. Prolonged exposure to loud noise can cause hearing loss, so if the noise level is painful or loud enough to keep you from hearing your colleagues speak at conversational volume, you need ear protection. And please, don't use dirty earplugs.
when airborne contaminants are present. When exposure levels are high. When ventilation isn't enough, you need a respirator. Before you get a respirator, a safety and health professional will evaluate the types of contaminants and the concentrations you'll be exposed to, so they can determine the right respirator for the job. Uh, can we stop for a second? I see what you're doing here, it's cute, but to be honest, David, a fake movie trailer? It's a little... well, it's a little 2008, don't you think? Okay, let's take it from the top, everyone. David, please. Lights. David. Camera. Don't make me pull rank. Action. Cut. My apologies, everyone. Let's continue with a review of the types of respirators. Believe it or not, a dust mask is technically a respirator and subject to regulatory requirements. It's easy to use and disposable, as its functionality diminishes over time when it's being used. David, really, this is important material. I know I promised you could be in charge of this segment, but we have important ground to cover, and you were making a mockery of it. Okay, David, why don't you show everyone how to put on a dust mask, and then you can walk us through the next segment. Disposables can only remove airborne particulates and are categorized as such. This chart shows the efficiency rating system of various respirators. The number in each designation corresponds to the percentage of efficiency, while the letters N, R, and P represent the filter's resistance to oils, with N having no resistance, R having medium resistance, and P having high resistance. Ahem. I'm sorry, David, but just watching you talk is boring. I think we have a good system where I talk and you demonstrate. Yeah, you're right. Let's continue then, shall we? A dust mask should be used to filter airborne particulates, not gases and fumes. To filter air containing gases and fumes, you'll need to step up to the next type of respirator, the negative pressure respirator. In this type of respirator, the wearer uses his or her own respiratory force to move air through the respirator. David, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but remember, you should be able to breathe normally through a respirator. In fact, before being issued a respirator, you'll have to get a medical clearance evaluation to make sure wearing a respirator won't interfere with your ability to breathe properly. Now, some of these respirators use replaceable cartridges with filters and chemicals to absorb gases and vapors. Different vapors and gases require different chemicals and compounds to absorb them, and your industrial hygienist will select the right respirator and, if necessary, the right cartridge. Need even more power? Then you'll step up to a powered air purifying respirator. These use a motor to pull air through filters and or cartridges to deliver purified air directly to you through a headpiece breathing tube. Bonus! The movement of air helps keep you cool and comfortable. The last type of respirator is supplied air. Pressurized, clean breathing air is supplied through an airtight hose to special headgear. Although there are certain types of underwater welding that are done in scuba gear, you really don't need the flippers, David. Depending on the respirator you'll be using, you may have to have a fit test. Not that type of fit, David. A test to make sure the respirator fits you properly and will provide the right protection. Which you've clearly done, David. The suit looks great on you.